of population collapse. This is why Elon keeps having kids. Things that don't grow die. No babies, no humanity. He's one of the few people who's called out the danger. The single greatest risk is the rapidly diminishing growth rate. Population collapse is coming. Every passing year, more and more couples are opting to skip having kids in order to simply enjoy each other's company and spend their time how they want. For example, a new survey just came out that reveals that only 55% of Gen Z and millennials plan to have children and that one in four of those surveyed between the ages of 18 and 34 has ruled out parenthood entirely with the most common reason cited being wanting time for themselves. These couples are starting to become role models for newlyweds because let's face it, who wouldn't want to share expenses with someone and have the freedom to do whatever they want, just like children would? These people are calling themselves dinks. And they're so proud of this identity that they've started building personal brands around it in order to make money online. We're dinks. 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 Kid free. Dinks. Dinks. Kid free. Now, I get where these people are coming from because I myself struggle with the fears around having children. Would having kids ruin my ability to live anywhere in the world that I want, whenever I want? Would they make me financially vulnerable? And on top of this, would I even be a good father in the first place? But most importantly, is there perhaps a broader question to consider beyond our own personal desires? What consequences will arise from the decline in population? Would our cushy lives remain the same? Or would a low fertility rate potentially disrupt our economies, social structures, and potentially the entirety of our way of life? Today, we're gonna dig into this together with my friends Malcolm and Simone, who are the hosts of the Based Cam podcast and who are working on the cutting edge of the pro-natalist movement. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Hello, it is wonderful to be here with you. So excited to dive into this. This is going to be a lot of fun. So my, my first question is this, and it's, it's an honest question. I don't think I'm even playing devil's advocate here. Why can't couples just enjoy life without having kids? They have other legitimate activities they can do, such as work, career advancement, traveling, etc. Why does any of this matter at all? So we think people absolutely should have the right to not get married, not have kids, and that the people who don't want to have kids um, and, and and don't want to live that lifestyle, per, like probably shouldn't. Uh, prenatalism as a modern movement is not about coercing people or shaming people into having kids. It's about making it easier for those who want to have kids, especially a lot of kids to do it. Um, but we 100% support the dink lifestyle. And, you know, they honestly probably wouldn't be great parents because they don't want to be parents. We don't want unwanted children, you know, to be fobbed upon people. We don't want people to have miserable childhoods. Here's the problem though. So if people who choose to not have kids don't have kids um, and don't really pass their culture on to anyone else or pass their values on, we're not going to have cultures in the future that support the right to not have a family, to not get married, to not have kids. We're only going to end up with very conservative cultures that that really impose that on other people. So if you want to be uh, a dink couple, great, fantastic, but you should still support pronatalist policies. You should still support people's right to have kids. And, you know, maybe don't shame them because they're probably, especially if they support your lifestyle and they're okay with it, are going to make sure that people in the future can make the same decisions you're making, which can be very fun. In other words, if the only cultures that survive are the ones who remove the right to not have kids, in the future, people won't get to make these types of choices. And we're already seeing countries begin to trend in this direction in locations like China, uh, where we're seeing things like restricted access to vasectomies increase and pressure from the governments on women who have chosen not to have kids to have kids. Uh, but when I look at something like this Dink video, I am incredibly grateful that this couple has chosen not to have kids because it is very clear that they don't have the emotional maturity to have kids. And I think that one of the questions we need to be asking is why are so many adults now in that position lacking the emotional maturity to be good parents? Well, let's go down that rabbit hole. What do you think is missing in culture that does not put us in a good place to actually bring forth life into the world in a way that uh, would potentially make the next generation better? A lot of it falls to the education system, I think. Uh, so when you look back at maybe just 40, 50 years ago in, in high school, there were auto shop classes, there were home ec classes. People learned how to basically run a household, fix things in their household, 
have a family. Um, and there was a lot more support for emotional resilience. And now you might think, oh, but now there's more care about like emotional resilience and mental health in schools than ever before. But to a certain extent, that appears to be backfiring. Focusing too much on emotions and all this is getting people to be overly neurotic, overly full of anxiety, overly focused on every little worry they have and making a big deal of it. So I think a lot of it is uh, education, it's culture, um, and, and people are not really given any social rewards for having kids. Instead, it's like, oh, wait, so you're going to put off your job. You're going to put off your career. You're going to sacrifice your amazing life and travel um, just to have kids like that. You know, it's not seen as cool. It's not seen as desirable and people aren't socially rewarded for it. So that as well. So people aren't given the tools to become good parents or really even like functional adults. Um, and they're also not rewarded for doing so. It's the cultural elevation of emotional fragility, which is happening because if you look at the dominant cultural group in the world today, what we often call on our podcast, Basecamp, the urban monoculture, uh, this is a cultural group that above all else um, uh, puts an emphasis on uh, the goal of one's life is to reduce the suffering one feels um, or to experience maximum amounts of hedonism. Um, and when that is how you are judging the quality of an individual life, the sacrifices that are involved in something like child rearing are not a good gamble. Like it is objectively, like if you are just trying to maximize the amount of uh, hedonism that you are experiencing in your life, kids are probably not a good bet. That is why most of the groups that are still healthy in their fertility rates have some sort of exogenous motivation to have kids, typically religious in nature. Got it. So you kind of bring up an interesting point here, and I am wondering, it sounds like by the way that you're talking about this, that there are certain places in the world that are doing really great with fertility rates, and there are some places in the world that are not doing so well. And it maybe sounds like the West might be in the realm of not doing so well? Is that a fair uh, assessment? No, actually. So a lot of people really miss into it uh, what different fertility rates are around the world. And typically this misintuiting has to do with uh, often like ethnic anxiety or religious anxiety was in their own country. So a great example of this, uh, there was a recent article in America's Quarterly about uh, titled Latin American countries. Sorry, I'm going to Pull it up so I don't say it wrong. Latin America's fertility decline is accelerating and no one is certain why. Um, and in this article, it goes over how the United Nations Population Division, and this is something that they regularly do, is they're like, oh, yes, Latin America's population fertility... Yes, Latin America's fertility rate is declining, but it will level off eventually. And they said it would level off in the second half of this century at around 1.75. Well, shockingly, as of now, every single country they were looking at, except for Mexico, has already fallen below 1.75, with many falling into the ultra-low fertility threshold of below 1.3. Specifically there, that would be Cuba, Costa Rica, Jamaica, and Chile. Um, and so a lot of people hear that and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Latin America is not just below repopulation rate, but lower in fertility rate than the United States. And it's like, yes, much lower in many places in Latin America. Uh, it fell below repopulation rate all the way back in 2019. And then they're like, oh, well, um, Muslims, they have a high fertility rate. And it's like, not really. If you look at countries like Iran, it's been struggling with a desperately low fertility fertility rate for a very, very long time. Um, and they've put in particularly draconian measures to try to get their fertility rate up, and it has been unsuccessful. The only places in the world where you really see a regularly high fertility rate are countries where the average citizen is earning less than 5,000 USD per year. And so people are like, well, those countries are demographically healthy. And I'm like, yes, but they're demographically healthy because they're economically not healthy. And it should be our goal to economically elevate these countries. Um, because when you look at what's leading to their high fertility rate, so this is something you see uh, in this latest change that we've seen in uh, Latin American fertility rates. Uh, 
which is that the the groups where fertility rates drops when you begin to get economic prosperity are the young groups. So I'm going to quote from that article I was mentioning earlier. Uh, Rothman says that the rapid adoption of these and other contraceptives contributed to a 55% drop in pregnancies to Argentinian women under the age of 20. In Chile, teen pregnancies have dropped by 70%. And in Uruguay, Cabela estimates that half of the recent fall in fertility is accounted for by women between the ages of 15 and 24. Four. So you can say, oh, in these countries where you have ultra young women, you know, younger than 20, accounting for a huge part of the fertility rate, is that country healthy in terms of fertility rate? I don't think so. I think where we want to be as a world is, yes, we want this initial fall in fertility rate that comes from young girls who didn't want to get pregnant getting pregnant. And then we should find ways to motivate um, adults to have kids during a time of their life where they're emotionally and economically capable of being the best parents they can be. So I was just talking to my girlfriend today and my girlfriend is from Russia. And when I told her that I was uh, talking to two pronatalists, she kind of got quiet on the phone because uh, she was like, I, I could tell that there was something on her mind. So I was like, hey, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, in Russia, uh, they're kind of trying to get people to have a lot more children because of the war and the death casualties as a result of it. And one of the policies that uh, politicians are throwing around is the idea of not forcing men to pay child support because it's it disincentivizes them to uh, potentially get someone pregnant and then uh, it, it just have get someone pregnant in the first place. Uh, and on top of that, when it comes to the prisoners that they drafted for the war, another policy that was being thrown around was this idea uh, that one of the politicians came and said, OK, prisoners, now that you've uh, been released from the war and you're back, you need to go out and have as many children as possible, which kind of speaks to the point that you were saying a little bit earlier in terms of, uh, you know, maybe there are people <laughs> in society that are not well suited to be parents. So it seems like right now with the countries that are at least thinking about this, there's a lot of bad policy being thrown around. Yeah. Well, so it's really interesting what you're talking about here with Russia, um, because it shows sort of the old world thinking. It used to be if you wanted to push your cultural value system, you would do that by through war, taking other countries' territory, then imposing your culture within the territory you had conquered. Um, but the future is going to be very different. You know, when I was working in Korea, I couldn't help but think that less than a hundred years ago, um, because like in Korea right now at their current fertility rate, even if it doesn't continue to decline and it's continuing to decline at a rapid rate year over year, they had an 11.5% drop in their fertility rate this year. Uh, for every hundred Koreans, there's only going to be six great grandchildren, but it's going to be worse than that. And I remember walking around Seoul and being like, who's going to inhabit these buildings? You know, um, they can't like, it's like, it could be Japan, but no, they're not going to get immigrants from there. Cause they also have a low fertility rate. It could be China, but no, they're not going to get immigrants from there. Cause they also have a super low fertility rate. And, and then it got me thinking less, a hundred years ago, Japan was able to motivate its population to go out, kill people, try to take this land, and yet now they can't motivate their population to just have kids, which would eventually give them cultural dominance in their region. So this old game of war no longer makes sense in the game in the world of cultural dominance anymore now cultural dominance in the future will be had by the groups that can motivate their citizens to have kids. Um, uh, however, I think that this also uh, sort of changes the game as well. It, historically, uh, a lot of people looked at this as like at the national level. Nationally, how do I motivate my citizens to have kids when realistically differences in fertility rates um, are predominantly driven by two things. They're driven by the wealth of a group. Typically, the more wealth it has, the lower its fertility rate is going to be. And then the culture of a group. And so within a country, there's going to be very wide differences between different cultural groups groups' is fertility rate, with those cultural groups primarily being divided by religion, um, with conservative religious traditions typically having the highest fertility rate, uh, although the situation is a little different in East Asia, uh, where um, even conservative religious groups often have fairly low fertility rates. Interesting. So I'll kind of pivot this next question. What countries are doing well with fertility? Because the way that we're talking about it right now, it sounds like the whole world is in trouble. I, I sure there's some country that's doing one, well. one country. There is one what? country that's okay in terms oh of fertility God. rate. Okay. Only one. And, and well, and it well, so so there's some countries that are doing better than others. So like the U.S. is particularly resistant to prosperity-induced fertility collapse. France used to show some level of resistance 
uh, resistance, but recently it slipped. It fell 7% year over year this year. Um, so that's the beginning of a really steep decline if you look at a graph. Um, but the one country that's been able to maintain both uh, economic productivity, so wealth, and a high fertility rate is Israel. Um, that is the, and, and, and in Israel, a lot of people are like, oh, that's just because of the, you know, the, the Hasidic community. Um, uh, and it's like, no, actually, even in Israel, even the secular community, even the, the secular Jews in Israel are above repopulation rate. Uh, and this comes to a counterintuitive point that often really surprises people. Uh, because a lot of people, when they hear fertility is declining, they're like, oh, I need to save my culture. How do I do that? I'm going to close all my borders. But if you look at countries uh, like uh, South Korea is a great example of this. They have very, very few immigrants, you know, when I was living there. Um, a, the countries that close their borders typically have the fastest fertility decline, whereas the countries that are the most diverse uh, have the slowest fertility decline. Um, and I think that this hints to what's going on in Israel. I think what the, the, the real reason why diversity lowers fertility decline is because it gives people more a sense of who they are and how they're different from the different cultures that are around them. So when you're constantly seeing people who are different from you um, and who look different from you, you're like, oh, this is why I should have kids. So people like me can continue existing. Um, and in Israel, I think that this is a particularly vivid thing for them where many people in Israel feel like if they don't have kids, like that they're in this constant cultural war that, you know, everyone around them is going to kill them if they don't make a point of continuing uh, their people. And so they're motivated to do this. But it also, I think, shows if you contrast something with a uniquely low fertility like, like China that's trying everything it's can to, to try to get its fertility rate up, um, and, and, and you have things like the We Are the Last Generation movement, right, where uh, a government official busted into this couple's house and was like, hey, if you don't do X and Y, you know, you're going to be punished and the next three generations of your family are going to be punished. And they go, oh, that's okay. We are the last generation. Um, and this is going to why China's having such a hard time motivating fertility, high fertility within its population, because these people know that the government only wants them to have kids so that the existing people in power can keep their wealth and can keep the power that they've accumulated where in Israel, when people are telling them to have kids, uh, they know it's for the good of their cultural group. You know, it's not just that the powerful can stay powerful. But this is a point that must be emphasized. A lot of people are like, why does it matter that fertility rates are falling this quickly? And I'm like, it really shouldn't matter. The problem is, is that we structured our entire economic system, not the West economic system, the entire world's economic system, assuming constant population growth. Uh, when that ends... Uh, the system will break uh, and it's going to be bad. You know, when people like Elon Musk are going out there and saying, oh, you, you guys should have kids. People are like, oh, he's doing this so he can keep his wealth. And it's like, no, Elon Musk keeps his wealth no matter what. It's the, the little old lady who is planning to live on her pension and, and you know, social security who's going to suffer from this. Um, and, and so we're going to see mass deaths, I think, uh, due to this economic system break. And we're going to see a lot a lot of a lot of governments becoming very sort of fascist in the way they try to motivate fertility rate which really scares me but then in addition to this you have the core cultural conflict which is coming out of this which is that low fertility groups most poignantly the urban monoculture that sort of exists around the world can only survive now by siphoning children sort of parasitically from high fertility or demographically healthy cultural neighbors um, and when they control school systems they begin to gear them just towards this cultural siphoning process, which of course leads to conflict between these two groups. And I think that this is going to be the core conflict of humanity over the next century. Uh, demographically healthy cultural groups that are really, really angry at groups that can only survive by taking their children. So everything that we've been talking about seems to run contrary to what I think most people would believe if you just casually ask them uh, about the idea of having children. I think a lot of people think that you're actually doing the planet a service by having less kids because you take up less resources and in a way it makes you morally better. If what you're saying is true, and let's say this urban monoculture has the incentivization to stay afloat, why is the fear of overpopulation so prevalent to the point that people kind of self-hate the idea around having kids? Well, it has, a, it wants to continue to exist. The urban monoculture wants to continue to exist. Within any society, those within positions of power 
are the individuals who least want any sort of change in global priorities uh, because they have power within the existing system. A change in priorities means a deprioritization of structures that allowed them to accumulate power. Um, Historically, fertility rates were increasing really quickly. Like around the world, uh, many of, of the old academic systems and the systems, uh, uh, rightly so, I would say, saw rapid and increasing fertility as a potential saw cause of concern. And so they developed narratives around this, and these narratives became deeply ingrained into how sort of their ethical systems worked and how their power hierarchies worked. Now that this is no longer the case, now that the statistics have sort of changed really rapidly, sort of out of nowhere, not a lot of people were predicting this, and many people are still denying it, even though it's very clear in the data, uh, they, there is huge risk to sort of change prioritization around this stuff. So I think that that's one reason. But I think the other reason is it's true. It is objectively true. Like if you don't have a kid, right, and, and, and the global system stays basically the same as it is now, that kid that you would have had is consuming world resources and everything like that, right? Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, if we all stop having kids really quickly, the global system as structured right now begins to fall apart. Um, and then you could have something like a collapse of globalism. If you have a collapse of globalism, that could cause a rise in global warming because now many regions are using dirtier fuel sources because they're more local to them and stuff like that. Um, and so we need to consider sort of these more complicated second layer effects uh, and, and what, what's that going to cause. But we're also seeing a growing philosophical divide among educated populations. Basically, there are the expansionists and the extinctionists. The expansionists are the people who are optimistic about the future. They want to have kids. They believe that through technology and development and innovation, humans can figure things out. And frankly, they have a good track record of being right. You know, for a while, people believe that, well, there's just no way we're ever going to be able to make enough food for this growing human population on Earth. Well, we solved that. There was a green revolution. We keep figuring out how to make enough food for everyone. Um, and, you know, with climate change, there are similar concerns. Uh, the expansionists believe we can get through that. We can get through that. We can get through AI. We will go off planet. We will become an interplanetary species. It's going to be great. Amazing. Um, then the extinctionists have a very negative utilitarian driven view, which basically focuses more on human suffering, especially in the moment now. No focus on the far future. No focus on human potential in the future, but really what's happening right now. And also suffering is really bad. And from their perspective, Many of them actually believe Earth would be way better off without any humans because, oh, look at all humans have done this, they've done that, and we suffer. It's better just not to exist at all. Um, and that's where you get this growing antinatalist sentiment. Um, but it really does kind of subconsciously fuel the ideology of dink couples, for example, who are just like, no, 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 I'm probably doing a good thing by not bringing more people into this earth. And when we speak to people at dinner parties we host and other events about demographic collapse being an issue, a very common response among many thoughtful, educated, intelligent, well-meaning people is, well, wouldn't it just be better if there were no humans? So we need to keep in mind that this is a growing philosophical divide. Um, but what's going to happen is the extinctionists are going to go extinct. The expansionists are who will be left. So if extinctionists care about any of the values that predominate their cultures, such as sustainability, saving the environment, et cetera, not to say that expansionists don't also care, but if they care about things, they need to figure out a way to sustainably support those policies among those who are having kids and who will inherit the future. And that's what's really cool about pronatalism as a cause area. Um, it's that the, the, the extinctionist group is going to just disappear eventually. Um, but uh, uh, it, it also interesting is that the number one strategy, cultural strategy for maintaining a high fertility rate in the world right now is for groups to either disengage with technology. Um, groups that disengage with technology typically have been able to maintain high fertility rates, Amish being a great example here, but you see this across communities, or engage in behavior as a community that lowers the economic productivity of the community because 
wherever you are, typically the less wealth you have, either between countries or within countries, the more kids you're going to have. Well, what this means is that these groups that are technophobic and economically unproductive are going to make up a larger portion of the world's future population. If you can even have a fairly small community, well, and another problem you have with these groups is they're often highly xenophobic. They've been able to maintain cultural isolation um, through this xenophobia, through the dehumanization of people outside their groups. So so as dangerous as the urban monoculture is to high fertility communities, the real danger comes when it's gone and now they're facing uh, just a huge number of technophobic, economically unproductive, xenophobic individuals. Um, and so what the pernatalist movement really is, is it's a beacon for those cultures that want to find new ways to motivate high fertility, but that are pluralistic, technophilic and interested in economic productivity. And even a small collection of these communities, due to the nature of their technophilia and the, the other predominant groups in the world's technophobia, will be able to have an outsized impact in humanity's future, particularly when we talk about the future of humanity reaching the stars, as people like the Amish are not going to be headed to the stars. Um, and so uh, right now we're sort of at this crucible in human history where every individual gets to decide, do I want to play a part in this grand human experience? experiment and be part of the iteration of humanity that reaches the stars. Uh, as we've pointed out in articles, if we had eight kids and those kids have eight kids and we do that for just 11 generations, we'd have more descendants than live on the earth today. Uh, but that would be a failure scenario. And this is why we're going out there and preaching so much. Uh, the, the, the cause of pronatalism is because we want people who see the world differently from us, who have different cultural backgrounds than us, to join the pronatalist movement so this group of humans that do eventually reach the stars can capture uh, the beauty of human diversity. Regarding these pro-technology strategies that you have in order to increase uh, fertility rates, uh, what, what are some? Well, uh, the most controversial that we use is uh, IVF and genetic selection, which we use within our family. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's definitely the most controversial, but there are, uh, you know, we promote as an organization technologies like artificial wombs, IVG technology. Uh, this is technology that would allow things like gay couples to have kids that are 100% biologically theirs. Um, so there's lots of technologies that we're on the cusp of that may increase fertility rates. And this becomes uniquely important when we look at falling biological fertility rates in humans. Uh, there are some studies, and you can Google this if you're interested in learning more about this, that predict that by 2060, uh, half of people in the developed world, half of men in the developed world uh, will be infertile um, because we are seeing a rapid decline in male fertility and, and female fertility as well, but it's a little less studied. Um, and so many of these groups that historically have been able to motivate fertility just through things like bans on pornography and bans on contraception and sort of relying on individuals to accidentally get pregnant, um, are not able to motivate fertility in the way that they used to be. This is why you're seeing this rapid collapse in fertility among Catholic majority countries in Latin America, but you're also seeing it in Europe. The average Catholic majority country in Europe right now only has a fertility rate of 1.3. That means they're basically halving every generation. Um, and so this means if you want to motivate fertility, we need new systems for doing that, not just saying, you know, don't engage with porn, don't, don't use contraception, um, but we need to say IVF is is important and you need to understand how IVF works and you need to understand how to use it, which is something that we would teach our kids growing up, um, while also promoting governments subsidizing systems like this. Uh, because when we talk about Israel having a great fertility rate, what's one thing Israel has, government subsidized IVF. But it's not just it's not just about science. And that's a really important point is that when you look uh, within, you know, a multicultural nation or country and you see like, OK, here are the groups that have really low fertility rates in here, the groups that have high fertility rates, the ones who are carrying the fertility rate of that country are those who follow hard cultures versus soft cultures. So a hard culture is one where you have to make the hard sacrifices, where you dress funny, you talk funny, you go to church a lot, you, you, you know, you, you get othered a little bit. You're kind of weird. Um, and among these technophilic populations that want to inherit the future, they're not going to inherit the future just by adopting tech. Um, they also need to adopt a culture that is hard, that that incentivizes them to have kids, but that also imparts uh, strengths and that imparts um, human flourishing. So right now, most 
developed nations are, at least in urban areas, overwhelmed by what Malcolm describes as the urban monoculture, which is a very soft culture. This is a, a culture where do what you feel like doing. Everyone goes to heaven, you know, and it, it, it do what feels good in the moment. Um, you don't have to make any hard sacrifices. It's someone else's fault, not your fault. Um, it's, it's very conformist, um, but not in a, not in a way that's like concerted. And there's not a lot of sacrifices that you make. These make people economically, mentally, socially weak. And they also don't incentivize them to have kids. Um, so we're also really big proponents of the cultural slash religion element of creating pronatalist cultures. We're not telling people, hey, man, if you don't believe in God or you don't believe in this particular religion, you somehow need to like figure out how to do it. You can make Str strong, hard cultures that are secular, that are based around science, that are based around nothing that has any sort of religious element. But you still need to do that. You need to other yourself. You need to make sacrifices and you need to create a culture that rewards and that that elevates having kids. This is why we wrote our book, The Pragmatist Guide to Crafting Religion. Uh, you, you do need to other yourself. She said, oh, you know, other yourself. But we mean this very seriously. When you look at high fertility groups, you know, whether it's like the Amish or the Hasidic, they look weird. W why is it that they look weird? Because we are defining weird by a group's cultural distance from the dominant cultural group in our society, the urban monoculture, this incredibly low fertility, negative utilitarian group. For us, if we want to be high fertility, we need to other ourselves. We need to look weird. And that means adopting different ways of dressing that help our kids remember their cultural identity is distinct from the urban monoculture. Different ways of naming our kids so that they remember that they're different. And restrictions in our daily lives. That we're not just doing whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it, so long as it doesn't interrupt other people's lives. That we actually have some forms of restrictions on how we act and that we do, um, because that's, that's how hard cultures work. They, they say, okay, you have a rule here, you have a rule here. But it's important to note that it's not just us who need to do this. It's not just secular individuals who need to make this change in this transition. Uh, I had mentioned the incredibly low Catholic fertility rate. Historically, the rules that increased Catholic fertility, like contraceptive restriction, porn restriction, stuff like that, uh, they don't work anymore to motivate a high fertility. So that means that this cultural group, if it wants to survive in the future, if it wants to join us in the groups that are going to survive, uh, they do need to adapt because the enemies that are fighting them, this urban monoculture, has adapted very rapidly and is fighting them with technology and tools that their culture was not built to fight against. I am reminded very much of being on the shore and colonists have, have just reached our continent and they've come with Gatling guns and we have spears. Um, and the guy next to me in the, in the pit is saying, oh, it's okay, my spear is blessed and, and I've received blessings. So that Gatling gun won't hurt me. Um, and yet I'm looking at the wave after wave that have just been mowed down and I'm like, no, look at the rates of deconversions right now. Look at what's happening to your kids. You can't just keep doing what you've always been doing anymore. We need to adapt if we're going to survive. And we in the prenatalist movement are here to help you, here to share cultural technologies between high fertility groups. One of the things that we spend our most time developing right now is the Collins Institute, which is designed to be an educational system that whatever a person's cultural practices are, it will not attempt to deconvert them. Um, but it will get them uh, well-paid jobs and everything like that, right? Um, but also things like dating markets. Like if somebody develops a new dating market, that's something that's broken in our society and would be of high utility across these new cultural groups. So in listening to everything that the two of you have said, I think going into this conversation, I wondered if the two of you wanted to create your own monoculture through you know the work that you're doing with fertility. But the more that I listen to you, the more that I kind of realize you want pretty much every perspective inside of this pronatalist movement because it allows for the next generation to suss out ideas and um, not, not necessarily come into conflict that's too confrontational, but for ideas to simply play out as they are rather than having certain ideas and certain ways of living inside of certain cultures that are going to disappear as a result of low fertility rate. Uh, you, you want everyone inside of this movement going into the future. Yeah, that's actually one of the biggest risks of demographic collapse. So Malcolm pointed out that our economic system is predicated on population growth. I mean, also our governments kind of depend on it, our pension systems, even city infrastructure will crumble 
crumble if we don't see growing populations in those cities that will continue to pay for the maintenance of roads and sewer systems and everything. So a lot of stuff is going to go wrong if demographic collapse isn't approached thoughtfully. And it's going to happen anyway. So we should just approach it thoughtfully. The biggest thing that we're concerned about more than any of these other things, to be honest, is cultural mass extinction. Some groups are going to make it through, yes, but many groups, if they, if, at least some small subset, and this is a very tractable, tractable problem because only a small number of families within any culture needs to develop intergenerational durability, culturally speaking, to carry that culture into the future. Not everyone has to get on board, like with climate change. Um, they can survive, but if these if, if small subsets of these cultures don't figure out how to become intergenerationally durable, they're gone. Goodbye, South Koreans. Goodbye, Janes. Goodbye, Native Americans. Goodbye, Emiratis. These are groups that are just going to disappear. And we really want a very strong, robust marketplace of ideas to be out there of different worldviews. We like it when people disagree with us. And if in the future we're hit by new existential threats that we can't even imagine, wouldn't it be better if there were 384 different cultures and religions taking a crack at the problem rather than five? It's just something that we really worry about. So yeah, basically, if you care about plurality, if you care about human innovation, you should care about demographic collapse and especially groups that are seeing a very rapid decline in fertility. It's so funny. Far progressives, though, they pretend to care about diversity, but they also pretend that everyone's actually exactly the same. Men and women, exactly the same. Different cultural groups, exactly the same. How can diversity be a thing of value if humans aren't actually different from each other? We take a very different perspective. We believe diversity is a thing of value because different genders, different cultural groups bring very unique set of proficiencies and perspectives that are useful and make us stronger. One of the very interesting things about being sort of a, a cultural Darwinist, you could say, where I think that humanity improves intergenerationally through a diversity of cultural groups competing with each other and the better ideas winning out is that you can only have that competition if you have diversity. If humanity becomes a monoculture, we lose that competition, which is historically what has allowed mankind to become this beautiful, great, evolving thing and, and in human cultures to be that. Uh, and it, it, it absolutely terrifies us that we might be entering a world that is incredibly more monochromatic than the world of our ancestors. Um, but the type of diversity that we champion, a diversity in which people are respected for their actual differences in perspective and proficiency, is a type that is an anathema to the urban monoculture. Malcolm and Simone, thank you so much for all of this. And thank you for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to find you online? They can find us on our YouTube base camp or a podcast base camp where we would love to interview you about your mission and your work because I absolutely love your your shorts so far. I'm excited to see this transition that you're making. You are one of the most wholesome influencers out there that actually gives real, efficacious, and actionable good advice. Thank you so much. That's making me smile. I know you can't see it, but I, I very much appreciate that. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. And uh, to everyone watching at home, stay frosty. We'll see you next time.